the objective that I have for you guys today is to increase your understanding and application of neuroscience with a broad overview. So we're not going to be going into extreme detail on any particular topic, but hopefully by the end, you'll have a decent foundation to build off of. Okay, so that's the goal. Now, uh, here's an overview. We'll start with some some fun brain facts here. And starting with, did you know that after 10 seconds, um, basically, uh, you'll be unconscious if you lose blood supply to your brain. So blood is being supplied to your brain right now. And without it, 10 seconds later, boom, you're unconscious. Another one would be your brain cells begin to die in about five minutes without oxygen. So 10 seconds, you're unconscious, five minutes, your brain cells start to die. There's tiny electrical currents in your brain and chemical messengers they're sending information at about 268 miles per hour it's it's pretty fast there's enough electrical current in your brain to power an led light bulb if you hold your fists together it's the approximate size of your brain and we use all of our brain unless it's damaged so it's kind of an urban myth that we only use like 10 percent or some small percentage of our brain um, there's an argument to be made that we might not be using our full capacity at any given point in time, but we definitely have a reason to have the different parts of our brain. All right. And the folds in our brain, as you can see in the picture, um, they, uh, basically increase the area, um, of the, the brain. And you'll notice that, that babies have smoother brains than adults, uh, which is quite interesting. So... We'll go on to the next one here. Um, the brain is amazing. It, it's basically only three pounds. Uh, it's 2% of your body weight, but it uses 20% of your body's energy. Um, and even more for an infant or children, right? So you, you would think that, you know, 60% for an infant of, of the body's energy is going to the brain. That's a lot. Your brain is rapidly developing as a child. It's the most complicated system, really, that we know of in the entire universe. Um, you can ask questions about the meaning of your own existence. Uh, it's pretty phenomenal. It, basically metacognition and the nature of God. And we can, can, we can contemplate the smallness of atoms all the way down to, you know, the nucleus and even farther and the enormity of, of the entire universe. And so really what we want to talk about is getting into the structure and function of the brain, senses, biochemistry, brain imaging. I'll show you guys a video and then we'll wrap it up. But it's going to be kind of a rapid overview here of some neuroscience. All right, so let's get going. Uh, neuroscience is a multidisciplinary science. It's concerned with the study of the structure and function of the nervous system. So there's a lot of different body systems. The nervous system is really the one we're going to focus on today. The central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system are the two main components of your nervous system. The central nervous system is going to include your brain and spinal cord, whereas the peripheral nervous system is kind of all the branches that come out from that. And so we can classify that even further. So we have CNS for central nervous system, PNS for peripheral nervous system. Your brain and spinal cord really make that up. And your brain receives and processes sensory information, initiates responses, stores memories, thoughts and emotions, and so on. Your spinal cord conducts signals um, to and from the brain, and it controls your reflexes. So sometimes uh, if you touch a hot stove, it's inefficient for you to send that information all the way to your brain. It can just do it with the spinal cord. And then your peripheral motor, uh, nervous system, we can split into motor neurons and sensory neurons. And so uh, basically motor neurons are muscles and glands, uh, and then sensory neurons, uh, such as the, the skin or the eyes, like sensory organs. Um, and we can split that even further into the somatic and autonomic um, for the motor neurons. So we have voluntary movement and involuntary movement. You can probably think of some examples of each, um, but we can break it up even further. Uh, and so with involuntary movement, we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So we have our fight or flight response like adrenaline, and we have our rest or digest. And so we all know that, for example, breathing could be voluntary or involuntary. Like you can kind of think about breathing or consciously, uh, but you can also do it um, without consciousness as well. 
All right. So one of the things that's interesting about the brain when people first started um, studying it is if you look at the brain, it seems to be split right down the middle. And so this guy named Roger Sperry in uh, 1981 won a Nobel Prize in physiology for his discoveries concerning the functional specialization of the cerebral hemispheres, right? And so his idea is that you have a left brain and a right brain, and it's connected by this corpus callosum structure. And a lot of research was done into this, and it seemed to be that the the left brain had th uh, more to do with uh, these things over here, so you know, linear thinking, mathematics, and a lot of the left side of your brain controls the 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 right side of your body, and then the right side of the brain would be more for arts and imagination, and controls more of the left side of the body. And so, for example, if somebody has a stroke on the right side of their brain. Um, they might have some drooping on the left side of their body. Um, but this this model has been largely disproven over the years. It's it's really oversimplistic. Um, it's, it's fascinating to kind of think about it, but remember, our brain is the most complex uh, system in the universe. So we, we can't just think about it as two pieces, right? It's way, way more complicated than that. So we have to go deeper. There, there's another theory of, of the brain. It's called the triune theory of the brain. And it's basically the idea that you start with your brain stem, your reptilian brain. It's the innermost part of your brain responsible for survival and autonomic you know, processes, fight or flight responses, things like that. And then you have your mammalian brain, um, basically kind of what makes you a mammal, your mid your midbrain. Um, and it controls emotions, uh, you know, social aspects, uh, sensory relays. And then, you know, if you continue with this outgrowth of the brain, you basically get to the part which makes you human, which is your neocortex or your forebrain, your neomammalian um, brain. And it's the most highly evolved part of our brain. And it's not even really fully developed until we're about um, 25. And that's really responsible for rational thinking, um, and abstract thinking, uh, memory, uh, self-control as well. So you might think about why, um, you know, as we mature into adults, why it's maybe easier to control our emotions. Uh, it might be easier for us to uh, think rationally about things as we develop. So there's another way to divide the brain too, right? So it's, it's a really complicated uh, system. We just have different ways of kind of simplifying it, right? So we have the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. So the cerebrum is broken into these different lobes, right? And then your cerebellum could also be broken into different lobes as well. You have the anterior lobe um, and the, the posterior lobe and so on. And then you have the brain stem. So you have the, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And so that's another way to kind of divide the brain as well. Another thing that you might divide the brain on is base, based on function. So you have different maybe functional areas of the brain. So different areas of the brain could be responsible for different functions. So complex behaviors and, and, and disorders are, are not well understood, but general functions are kind of understood, I guess, is the, is the point. And so physical movement, for example, um, involves a lot of different areas, um, but uh, almost all behavior involves the motor area. So control of your voluntary muscles. So when you speak, for example, you have to move your mouth and your tongue and there's a lot of movement that goes on there. So any sort of voluntary movement uh, is probably going to make use of that motor area of the brain. And one way to think about this is that your frontal lobe governs and your cerebellum will coordinate. So, um, for example, uh, your posture and your balance are thought to be controlled by the cerebellum. Now, speaking and comprehending is um, also going to involve the motor area because, remember, we have to move our mouths and whatnot. Um, we have special areas, though, uh, that we could talk about as well. And so we have the the Wernicke's area that creates a plan, the Broca's area that executes the plan, and the motor area kind of carries out the plan. So that's one way to think about speaking. And then comprehension uh, could be thought of uh, as the Wernicke's area um, over here for language and comprehension. And so these are just kind of general um, areas uh, of the brain that we can kind of assign functions um, and we also can talk about memory. So we can talk about the idea that there's really not a lot of evidence that there's any such thing as forgetting things. Like there's really no such thing as forgetting. Um, in other words, forgetting really just means the inability to recall stored information 
or the failure to store the information in the first place. And then you have three kinds of memory. We'll talk more about this later on in a different uh, uh, different lesson. But the idea is that um, your, your sensory memory, you have a whole bunch of information coming in through your senses. We'll talk about our senses a little bit in a little bit. But um, it'd be really uh, inconvenient if you had to remember all of that. It's a lot of data, right? So a lot of that just disappears fast. It's not ever really even given a chance to be encoded. Um, it's kind of governed by our attention a little bit, right? So w what are you paying attention to? Uh, then your short-term memory has a limited capacity, just in minutes, basically, it, but it can be refreshed. So it's your working memory. So are you thinking about something? Uh, you're working on a problem or whatnot. That's in your short-term memory. And then that then it can be stored into long-term memory, and that's going to disappear in, in the days, weeks, years, lifetime. And so that's kind of uh, the, the, the three-store you know, model of memory. And we also have protection, right? Our brain is, you know, extremely important. It, it's a huge part of who we are. It's basically what makes us who we are. It's responsible for our consciousness. And so we have to protect it, right? So our outermost layer is the skin. Then we have the periosteum. Um, and, and that's going to be our connective tissue. And then we get into some bone. And so we got our cranium, our skull, and uh, it forms a nice cavity for our brain. Uh, and then we have membranes. So the outermost one is the dura, um, dura matter. And then we have the arachnoid membrane. We have pia matter and we have the brain. And we also have this cerebral spinal fluid, uh, which is a, a clear um, protective cushion for the brain. So you can think about your brain kind of floating around in there. And if you were to get in a car accident, for example, your brain would actually be colliding with your skull. And so... Um, that's what happens a lot of times when we have tra uh, traumatic uh, brain injuries, TBIs, is a collision between the brain and the skull. Okay, so the next thing is the brain cells. So what is your brain made of? Right? So we've probably all heard of neurons or, or nerve cells. Um, basically, these cells are electrically excitable and they transmit information, uh, basically by using electricity, um, but also chemical signals as well. And so we have glial cells as well. Um, those are probably less familiar to you. That's they're called neuroglia, and they provide support. So if you see this right here, we have a neuron and another neuron, and there's a synapse, which is the area between neurons, and then the glial cells you can view as supporting cells um, around them. Another interesting fact is that the human brain has about a, a hundred billion nerve cells. And that number is kind of hard to understand. So to put it in perspective, there's nearly 8 billion people on Earth right now. And so basically you have uh, way more nerve cells in your um, brain than there are people on Earth, which is pretty crazy. Now, to make it even more complicated, each one of those neurons, basically a typical neuron, has over a thousand synapses or connections, right? So... That makes, if you multiply those together, basically, you're, you're roughly left with 100 trillion connections in the brain. And that number is kind of unimaginable. Uh, it's so big. So you have a, that's why it's the most complicated system, basically, in the world. And so 100 trillion connections is just crazy, crazy. Um, and then you have nerves. Uh, nerves are just bundles of these axons that are traveling together, and they can be very long. Okay, so that kind of works out some of our terminology of the nervous system and what it's built of. We also have neurotransmitters. So those are chemical messengers that they transmit signals across these synapses, right, the area between neurons. And uh, they can be responsible for a lot of different things. They're created within the body, um, and they control our overall mood and cognitive function. And also drugs uh, like alcohol or cocaine or whatever, um, they can influence our uh, behavior by altering this neurotransmitter uh, activity. So when you study um, the, the chemistry of drugs, a lot of times you're looking at how it's affecting um, the nervous system. Okay, And you have like uppers, downers, and all-arounders. Um, so drugs that kind of suppress your uh, nervous system, drugs that kind of amplify your, your nervous system, and drugs that kind of throw you all over the place, like uh, LSD, um, and for example. So here's some of the neurotransmitters here. We have um, adrenaline, which you're probably familiar with. That's fight or flight. We have noradrenaline for concentration, dopamine you're probably familiar with for pleasure, serotonin for mood. We got all sorts of different ones here. And so 
just understand that all these are just chemicals. They're, these are molecules. They're made of atoms, and they're just little chemical messengers that are, um, you know, all over your, inside of your brain. Um, okay, so now we have uh, hormones. So those are um, another kind of important um, uh, messenger, if you will, um, kind of similar to neurotransmitters. Um, but it's not just limited to the brain. So they're regulatory substances, and they pr they stimulate specific cells or tissues into action. And so hormones are really important for communication. So um, two things that you two of them that you might recognize is testosterone and estradiol or estrogen. So you have androgens and estrogens, and those are your sex hormones. And so we have um, you know your testes uh, for androgens and uh, ovary for estrogens. And we also have cycle hormones, so hormones that are released in a cycle. Um, and so we have cortisol, uh, which is released in a cycle, but also during stress. So if you're stressed out, we have um, cortisol. And keep in mind, again, these are all compounds, um, just uh, just collections of atoms that form a molecule of uh, cortisol. And uh, we have melatonin, um, which is released by the pineal gland. Um, it's triggered when, for example, there's not a lot of light out. So when it gets dark outside, um, it tells your pineal gland to release melatonin. And that's why you start getting tired. One of the reasons why you start getting tired to go to sleep at night, which is why it's probably not easy to go to sleep in a really, really bright room unless you're exhausted. Um, your menstrual cycle, if you're female uh, and pregnancy, are also uh, regulated by hormones, but it's a very complex interaction of hormones. Um, so clearly women do not produce breast milk all the time, right? There's um, pregnancy triggers release of hormones that uh, will kind of open up those uh, mammary glands and you will start producing milk. There's another thing to mention too is, remember we're talking about the brain, kind of the master gland here is the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is going to stimulate the pituitary gland to release TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, your thyroid is right here. Your thyroid releases hormones, especially T3 and T4 into your blood, and that controls your overall metabolism, so your cell activity. So you've probably heard of hyper or hypothyroidism. And so hyperthyroidism is associated with, um, but, uh, you know, increased metabolism, potentially increased appetite, and hypo is too low. And so you've probably heard of that. Um, hormone classification, they can be classified into different, um, in different ways. There's a lot of different hormones, but you can have uh, peptide hormones like insulin, you probably heard of, steroid uh, hormones like uh, cortisol and estrogen, you probably heard of, and then amino acid derivatives, you've probably heard of adrenaline. Okay, so we'll keep moving on. Your circadian rhythm is important. Um, and so you've probably heard of this, uh, but the idea is that your body operates on a cycle and it has a lot to do with those hormones, those cycle hormones. Um, but it's really all about getting your body into a rhythm. And so we could start in the daytime. Uh, when you wake up, you have a sharp rise in your blood pressure. Your melatonin secretion stops. You you have a bowel movement, which is likely to happen <laughs> because your bowel movements are suppressed at night. Um, you have uh, your highest level of testosterone, high alertness, right, right around 10 o'clock. Um, your in your best coordination, your fastest reaction time, all that stuff. Highest blood pressure, highest body temperature. Um, and then we're going to go to bed. So your nighttime, melatonin is going to start secreting. Um, you're going to have your your brain waste products cleared through your glymphatic system. So that's one of the reasons why we need to sleep. I mean, you literally can die without sleep. Um, so lack of sleep is is really a, a, a horrible thing. Um, your bowel movements again are suppressed. Uh, your body's repaired, and you're in your deepest sleep here. Uh, right around uh, two in the morning. This is just an average cycle. Obviously, it's different for everybody. For example, you have people that work the night shift uh, and whatnot that you kind of have to adjust your circadian rhythm based on uh, your needs. But um, everybody does have some sort of a cycle that they operate on. Um, and so then you have your rapid eye movement sleep, your REM sleep. And your brain is actually really active during that sleep. You might think that it's not, but it is. And it stands for rapid eye movement sleep. Um, it's a really important aspect of sleep. And then you have your lowest body temperature, and then you wake up. So the National Sleep Foundation in 2006 found that 87% of high school students in the U.S. are sleep-deprived. 
um, a lot of you are probably sleep deprived as well. So I'm sure I'm sure that this extends to college students. Okay, now losing sleep is associated with um, learning um, losses, right? It affects your memory, your mood, reaction time, inflammation. You can cause hallucinations, high blood pressure, illness, hormonal imbalance, stroke, or even death. And so it's recommended that uh, adults need approximately um, seven to eight hours of sleep per night. And children and adolescents need more. And so if you're not getting that sleep, um, you might have to make up for it uh, in other ways. Uh, Maybe you'll take a nap uh, in the day or maybe you'll go a few days without a lot of sleep and then you'll, you'll be able to sleep in on the weekend or whatnot. Um, But you definitely can suffer um, due to sleep deprivation. Okay. So now we have our cranial nerves. Um, Basically um, an important aspect of, of the brain are the the main brain nerves, right? So you have 12 pairs emerging from both sides of the brain, and they're located in the head and neck regions. And you can have sensory, motor, or just mixed. Um, But they govern your five senses and more. And so we'll talk about uh, your five senses here. It's important. So how do we get data from our environment? Uh, into our brain. So we have our sight. We can see things, right? Are things visible to us or invisible? Um, If you're blind, uh, then clearly this is not working correctly. But the idea is that we have waves of light, uh, photons, um, at different uh, wavelengths out there for us to see. Now, it's a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. Very small part. Um, there's other light like x-rays and infrared microwaves, radio waves that we cannot see, but there's a small part that we can see, right? And that determines all these different colors that we have defined over the years to be, you know, Roy G. Biv. Now, the idea is that these waves come in when you have your eyes open, right? (laughs) You don't see it with your eyelids closed. You open your eyes and this light comes in and it, it first hits your cornea. And if somebody has ever scratched their cornea, you probably know what that is. Um, and then you you get into the, the lens here. So you have your pupil and your iris. But one of the key players is the lens. And the lens's responsibility is to change shape to focus the light onto the back of your eye, which is called your retina. And so on your retina, and you have your optic nerve, which will then send it to the brain, right? But your retina has all these cells here, and they have there's cone cells for color and rod cells for low light situations. Um, but those are, you know, kind of sensory cells that will help you determine what you're looking at um, and then send that information to the brain. The image is usually formed upside down, and your brain brain kind of has to flip that right side up again. So there's some interesting stuff that goes on there. But that's how we extract data from our environment in the form of light. Now we go on to hearing. So we're going to extract data from our environment in the form of sound, which is in the form of basically air molecules that... Um, are propagating sound. So it's another form of a wave. It's not an electromagnetic wave. It's a mechanical wave. And so you have areas of increased pressure and decreased pressure in the air around you. Um, So right now, as I'm talking, um, my voice is going into the microphone. It's being converted into basically electricity. It's being transmitted all, you know, all over the place. Eventually it gets into your computer. Uh, it's sent into your speakers or headphones and then your headphones have to start vibrating at, you know, what it tells it to do. And then my voice is being reproduced probably in a distorted way from what you would hear if you were listening to me in person. Um, and then your ears have to interpret that. So the sound, uh, eventually will get into your ears here, but let's talk about, um, this threshold of audib- audibility. So it are, is sound audible or inaudible? Obviously, there's people that are deaf. They can't really hear anything, right? So um, our ears are really important for this. And so we we have this uh, idea of intensity uh, measured in decibels and frequency measured in hertz. Now, there's certain frequencies that are too low and too high for us to hear. So, for example, um, as you get older, um, usually you can't hear as high a frequency. And so there's this story where some kids were messing around at an old person's home, um, you know, like a retirement community. And what they did is over the loudspeakers, they would play this really, really high pitched sound and the kids could hear it. And it was extremely annoying, but 
none of the <laughs> community members could hear it because they were too old. Um, and so you can uh, kind of do that test if you want at some point and play different frequencies. At some point, you won't be able to hear it anymore. And then decibels, threshold of pain, right? So if you hear, um, you know, if you, a gunshot goes off right next to your ear, clearly that's going to be, a, you know, a really high decibel rating. Um, and you could potentially have permanent hearing loss. It's not just about the intensity. It's also about how long you're exposed to that. So if you're at a loud concert for a long time, it might not be as loud as a gunshot, but it could actually cause more damage because it's, you're, you're having that decibel rating for a, a long period of time. Okay. So that sound wave comes in through your ear, your auditory canal, uh, your outer ear, basically. And the purpose of your outer ear is to collect the sound. So you have the shapes of your ear to kind of focus that sound into your ear. Um, and then it gets into here uh, to your eardrum, and that's really the start of your middle ear. And so you have three important bones here, um, your stapes, your incus, and your malleus. And that acts to amplify the sound. So your eardrum... Um, basically through, uh, your eardrum has a, a significant amount of area here and there's not a lot of area over here. And so through this, the process of these three little bones, it's basically amplifying the sound and hearing aids, um, their job is to help you amplify the sound if you're, if you're starting to go deaf. Now, it's basically banging up against your inner ear or your cochlea. Now, your cochlea um, is basically full of fluid and the job there is to convert the, uh, these messages here into an electrical signal and then send it through the cochlear nerve to the brain. And so that's where you get your data fr from the environment in terms of hearing things. Then smelling, right? So when we smell things, <laughs> clearly that's more information about our environment. What's going on there? Well, these um, odor molecules are going to enter your nose and into your nasal cavity, right? And you have all these nerve endings. And if you look at this olfactory epithelium right here, if you kind of zoom in, you can see these odor molecules coming in. And they're going to be interacting with these nerves, these olfactory nerve fibers, and sending that information to um, your brain. And... Uh, and so you can say, is something, does something have odor or is something odorless? So for example, um, natural gas, like methane gas, if you turn on your, if anybody has a gas oven, you turn that on, it's going to stink, but it's not actually stinking because methane has a smell. Methane is odorless and they have to add sulfur compounds in order to make it stink so that it's safe. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to detect a gas leak very easily, and that'd be super dangerous because now you have a flammable gas leaking into your house, and you don't know it. And so the human nose is very sensitive to sulfur, um, and so that's why they do that. Now, taste, um, you have, it's been identified that uh, there's about five, you know, kind of categories of, of taste. And so you have taste buds, um, and uh, there's different parts of your tongue here. Um, but the general idea is that you, you know, as you taste things, um, you, you're going to have some sort of a rating of all of those categories. And that information is then sent um, through your afferent nerve um, in, to your brain and, you know, with these taste uh, receptor cells. And so that'll give you information about the taste of something. But there's also, um, remember, when you eat something, the overall taste of something is not just determined by the tongue. It could be the smell and everything else. Um, so a lot of the information overlaps to form a big picture, right? What you're seeing, what you're smelling, what you're feeling, is it's all coming together to build your overall perception of the world. Now, one of the, the last things here is touch. So when we touch things, it seems to be the most obvious maybe, but we have hair all over our body. Um, and that's important. Um, so, uh, when we go down deeper, that basically the skin is the largest org organ of your body and the, it's, it's a huge kind of part of your peripheral, you know, nervous system is to, to gather data, um, sensory data, um, by through touch. And so you have all sorts of different receptors here, cold receptors, pressure receptors, touch receptors, pain receptors, 
And uh, that's one way to kind of view that. But the one idea to think about here is, do you feel th- something or are you numb to it, right? So we can actually um, inject chemicals into a particular area of the body. For example, Novocaine during a dental procedure, if you've ever gone to the dentist and gotten Novocaine, and you will not feel that particular area. It basically numbs that area so it no longer can send that information about pain um, to your brain. Uh, it's not that you're, you know, the same procedure is not happening. It's just that you're not as as aware of it, right? Okay. So now we get into nerve impulses. So that's really important because now we we understand what a you know n- neuron is hopefully now, um, and we understand that you know we get all of this data from our environment through our senses, uh, but we want to kind of dive in into a little bit of the uh, biochemistry and figure out what is exactly happening in the nerve cell um, in order to send these messages, right? Because we're, we're told that nerve cells and your nervous system and your brain have something to do with electricity. What does that mean? How do, what does that look like? Um, and so we'll hopefully talk more about that now. It's something called the action potential. So there's a change in, a, in electrical potential. If you're familiar with um, you know, electrical engineering or uh, physics, you, you're probably as, are familiar with the word voltage, but uh, the term action potential is is referring to the change in electrical potential or voltage associated with the passage of an impulse along the membrane of a, a muscle cell or nerve cell. And so, one important thing to note here is that the frequency of the action potential um, can change, but but not the magnitude. So, um, in other words, if if you are outside and you feel a breeze, um, you know, your nerve cells are going to detect that because the air is exerting forces on your skin, right? But it's not going to be very frequent in terms of the impulses because it's not a ton um, of, of pain that you're in. It's not a ton of th- stuff that you're feeling. But if somebody, you know, hits you in the arm with their fist or with a baseball bat or something, it's going to then trigger a lot of nerve impulses. So it's not as much the magnitude of the impulse, it's more of the frequency of impulses, how many are going on, okay? So uh, with an intense pain, it would fire a lot versus a breeze, okay? Now, this is an interesting picture because it's an actual picture of the brain here. And so we can separate the brain into this gray matter and white matter. And one thing that is interesting about this is this idea of myelin sheaths. So you can see the picture right here, the myelin um, on this axon. And the idea is that myelin sheaths are going to speed up your connection. And gray matter contains not as much myelin. um, And it's mainly responsible for generating the impulses. So this part right here. And then if you see the white part, the white matter, that has a ton of myelin sheaths. And so that is more responsible for transmitting, um, which makes sense because we said that myelin is going to speed up um, the, the connection. And so um, the, the interesting thing here is that the main reason for the color difference here is because of the whiteness of myelin. So the myelin is, is what's making it white. So let's get into the chemistry part of this, right? So you have this idea of a cell. Now, here's your cell membrane outside of the cell and inside of the cell. How, how is this electricity happening, right? Well, we have ions, and ions are charged particles. Um, and so we have sodium ions, so Na+, plus, positively charged ions, calcium 2+, plus, chloride negative ion and potassium. We're going to focus on potassium and sodium, okay? Now, let's kind of take a journey on how a nerve pulse actually happens, which is going on right now in your body. So the idea is that you have to have some sort of a polarization of this membrane. Polarization meaning like north pole, south pole, it has to become charged. So you have this idea of a resting potential. Now this is just, the reason why it's called resting potential is because the nerve cell is is not firing. It's not really doing anything. This is just the potential, the the voltage that exists, the, the polarization that exists in it being ready to fire, okay? So you have this net positive charge and this net negative charge, okay? So we have the the movement of ions to facilitate that difference. 
And so how do these ions move? Well, we have different ways that that can happen, but we have protein channels for these ions. Um, and this idea of, of passive um, transport or facilitated diffusion. And so we have uh, different gates on them. So we have voltage-gated sodium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels, mechanically-gated ion channels, um, and even ligand-gated ion channels. And we also have active transport. And if you remember, passive transport doesn't require really any energy or ATP. Active transport does. And so we also have these pumps, these sodium-potassium pumps, the two ions that we're going to focus on. And that requires ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. That's your body's like cellular energy currency. Um, and so this is going to um, basically make sure that uh, you have this resting potential at any given point in time. So this this balance, right, this graded potential, and it's going to fix any sort of um, small changes. And this can actually account for 20 to 40 percent of the brain's energy use. So right now, 20 to 40 percent of your brain is actually just being used to maintain this this potential. Now, you get into the nerve impulse here, so let's go through the steps. So you start off with this resting potential at negative 70 millivolts, and at some point you're going to have this action potential triggered, right? This is the threshold at negative 55. All of a sudden a nerve impulse is going to start to happen, and so let's talk about what that looks like. Okay, so you have the resting potential, you have your, your sodium uh, closed, and your, your potassium is closed, and then... We are going to open up our sodium channels, and we are going to allow the sodium ions to flow into the uh, through the membrane. And so we are clearly then going to start building up our um, our membrane potential here. Then we're going to have a depolarization. So as we approach zero, the it's no longer polarized, right? And then we're actually going to overshoot. So we're going to go into the positive region. Instead of just having a negative resting potential and, and depolarized, we're actually going to overshoot. And then our body's going to be like, uh-oh, we overshot, right? We got to now inactivate it. We don't want to keep pumping sodium in, right? We're done. We got enough positive stuff in there, <laughs> okay? And then it's in a, inactivated, and we start to open up our potassium channels and we start pumping positive charge in the form of potassium out because we're like, hey, get rid of this. We got enough. And then it repolarizes when it goes back, um, you know, past zero. And then your sodium and potassium channels are um, closed. And we have this hyperpolarization, so there's kind of like a little bit of an overshoot in the opposite direction, and then you go back to normal. Now that all happens in about one millisecond. So that's what happens every time a nerve cell fires in your body, which is just crazy to think about all that happening, all those little molecular messaging systems that are happening. Okay, so it makes you think about the brain efficiency, right? So using your entire brain at once would be very inefficient, right? So we do use all of our brain, but not all at once. So it's something called sparse coding. So only a small percentage of cells are signaling at one point in time. Not all of your f nerve cells are firing at once. That'd be crazy. So there's a small number of signals, but they have thousands of paths, remember, um, to distribute themselves. And so for most efficient operation of the brain, it's going to be somewhere between 1 and 16% of, of your cells should be firing or active at any given time. And so this is like the energy limit of our consciousness. So that's what I was talking about earlier when we have like a, you know, we only use 10% of our brain. In, in a way, we kind of do because, you know, we, we are limited um, in our capacity. We have some sort of an energy limit, okay, um, to our consciousness. And that's what makes multitasking very hard because in order to multitask, we basically have to split our attention between two tasks and switch between them very quickly. Um, our brain is decent at automating tasks over time, so um, that's good. But uh, basically the idea is that if you're multitasking, you're doing each task less effective as if you would if you gave it your full attention. So keep that in mind when you try to multitask. Okay, so the other thing to consider is is what sort of foods are affecting your brain, right? So, for example, um, lead. Now, lead can be ingested into your body through water, paint. I'm sure you've heard that old older homes have lead paint. 
um, which potentially could be associated with some of your projects. Uh, I don't know if anybody's here from uh, Habitat for Humanity, but some of these older homes might still have lead paint um, or fuel, etc. The idea is this lead gets into your blood, and then it binds to your red blood cells. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it starts to affect your neurons. It binds to these N MDA receptors, and it blocks glutamate, and it disrupts calcium ion signaling. It's going to then, you can kind of follow the path here, it's going to then reduce your calcium and increase your nitric oxide synthase, and it's going to lead to cell death, um, basically by decreasing your ne uh, neurotrophic factors, your NTFs, and it's going to decrease long-term uh, potentiation. The idea is that it basically leads to brain damage. So lead poisoning is very horrible, especially in children. There was a story of a child who was chewing on an old toy that was painted with lead paint from um, their grandparents and uh, ended up with permanent brain damage as a result because of the lead that was ingested. So um, just be careful. There are certain foods that are threats to our brain and certain foods that will help protect our brain. And then clearly exercise and sleep and intellectual stimulation is really key for a healthy brain. So that's kind of like brain health. Now, how do we know a lot of this stuff, right? Where do we get our data? So a lot of our data comes from um, these different tests that we can do. So we have positron emission tomography uh, or a PET scan, and uh, that uses a radioactive substance called a tracer. We have an EEG um, that records electrical fluctuations along the surface of your scalp. Uh, then we have this SPECT scan, which is a, called a single photon emission computed tomography. And that has either a surface view or an active view. Uh, we also have functional MRIs uh, as well. And that checks brain activity by measuring blood flow to certain areas of your brain. And so the idea is that these scans show how your brain and its tissues are working. And then there's also other imaging as well, but it mainly reveals structure. So like MRI, uh, CT scans, x-rays, ultrasounds, and so on. So we can collect data from the brain. Here's an idea here from Dr. Daniel Amen. He um, is a, uh, a fairly uh, well-known um, contributor to these scans. And uh, the idea is that if you have a healthy brain scan, it's going to look kind of something like this. And if you have a stroke or a couple strokes, this is potentially what your brain would look like on this scan. So we have clear damage to two areas of our brain due to a stroke. Now, if you have Alzheimer's disease, you can clearly, it's a na one of the most depressing, horrible diseases out there is Alzheimer's disease because you, you know, eventually are deteriorated to the point where you don't even know your loved ones anymore. Um, so your, your brain is clearly... Um, affected by Alzheimer's disease. Now you also have traumatic brain injuries uh, due to football or whatnot. Um, one of the common causes of traumatic brain injuries are is due to falling, just gravity. Think about that, just falling down the stairs or falling just anywhere, really. It's a huge source of, of traumatic brain injury. Uh, we also have uh, drug abuse. So um, clearly uh, different drugs will affect your brain and potentially lead to permanent brain damage. And we have uh, OCD, obs uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And so you can clearly see that the brain is much more active and you're basically obsessing over things. Um, and then we have um, healthy brain versus seizure activity. Seizure activity, clearly more activity going on during a seizure. We also have um, ways to improve, though, so it's kind of a, a positive note. So, um, you know, through neuroplasticity, your brain is very plastic. It can actually form new connections and improve itself. And so this was a teenage girl with ADHD and going from basically failure to, to success through treatment. And we have a situation um, with a woman who had dementia and through different treatment uh, was able to improve. Um, the state of, of what her brain was looking like. And we also have um, alcohol abuse. Um, so this was an fMRI uh, involving uh, alcohol craving. And so before the treatment, there's a ton of brain activity here. And after the treatment, there's not. So 
one of the things that they do um, with addicts, which is one of the number one causes of death of people under 50 in the United States, is drug overdose. So it's clearly an important thing to understand. And I'm, I'm sure all of you know somebody who has a, a drug problem. The idea is that they're going to develop certain triggers, and with those triggers, it's going to be a ton of activity uh, going on. So one of the one of the ways that they can treat that is exposing an addict to whatever those identifying and exposing an addict to whatever those triggers are, and then kind of counseling them through the pro- uh, process of making that not a trigger anymore. And so that's kind of what they do to help with that treatment. Um, now I have a little video here, and uh, this will get into. Um, a little bit more about how we can see see and understand the brain. Sometimes all you've got is a crazy idea and a lot of ambition. I had this feeling from very early in this project that there is a way to make this work. Don't know what it is yet, but there is a way. It's kind of like a wild dream. It's not something that you would intuitively expect to work. People told these guys they were wasting their time, that they should do something productive, but they just dug in further. Now, before I tell you what their crazy idea was, first let me say that Tilburg and Chen study the brain. The brain is extremely complex, so complex that we don't necessarily even know what we're looking for. The brain is like a circuit made out of cells called neurons. In a cubic millimeter of your brain, those cells will have about a billion connections between them, doing some fraction of a trillion things per second with millisecond timescale precision. For Boyden and his students, the brain is a vast and largely uncharted three-dimensional expanse. So we want to get what you might call the wiring diagram of the brain, but not just this, the wiring, all the molecules along with those wires that act those connections. Sure, we've got ways to map and image the brain already, but they've all got their limitations. MRIs reveal brain activity, but across large swaths. So zooming in on the neural nanoscale to see connectivity, forget it. Electron microscopes give incredible detail, but you can't label different structures with different colors, so you can't discern the 3D configuration of molecules and connections. The light microscope actually provides gorgeous images of brain slices, but there's a limit to how much you can see. There's an analogy to this where if you zoom into a digital photograph, you can see smaller things. At some point you get to a limit where you can see individual pixels, and if you keep on magnifying it, you're not going to see any more information about what was in that scene. Same thing with a light microscope. Zoom in past the size limit, into a synapse where two nerves meet, say, and you just get a blur. But what if you could somehow zoom past that limit? And this is where we get to that crazy idea, inflating the brain itself. We've been thinking about ways that you might be able to physically magnify the brain. Could you actually blow it up and make it bigger? And then look at it with the same old light microscope. But how do you enlarge a brain while keeping all of the nanostructure in place that you want to look at? Just to think that you could preserve all that complexity while basically destroying your sample, that's what's crazy about it. So here's the DIY version of how to actually do this in a handful of somewhat simplified steps. First, we take the brain of let's say a mouse, and we fix it with formaldehyde and that just locks down all the molecules. It's kind of like taking a snapshot. Step two, use the lab equivalent of a deli slicer to shave off a slice of brain. Step three, add fluorescent dye. Step four, embed that slice in a material that swells in size. That material, sodium polyacrylate, better known as the stuff in diapers that absorbs just an obscene amount of water. Step five, and this is the really counterintuitive one, digest away the brain. That prevents the tissue from tearing. Now all you're left with is the dye embedded in the diaper material. So you can think of that like taking a three-dimensional fluorescent cast. And then the cast is expanded by washing it in water. That's it. In other words, this is your brain on diapers. Or actually, this is your mouse's brain on diapers. Regardless, the result, once you place this cast, expanded four or five-fold under a light microscope, is just astounding a spray of neurons interlocking in three dimensions, bundles of axons coursing in all directions. Zoom further in to see actual proteins, all in color. This is the three-dimensional weave of the brain itself. 
this took months to figure out. And when Fei Chen and Paul Tilburg finally succeeded in doing this crazy thing, in magnifying a slice of brain tissue and then peering at it, well, there's nothing quite like seeing something that no one's ever seen before. You know, we had started this experiment pretty late at night, and we didn't really expect it to work. And we watched in the microscope as it began to expand. We were like, oh my god, it's working. We were so excited about it that we stayed up the whole night watching this thing every hour because we just wanted to see every single detail in this process. Went out and had breakfast and showed it to Ed. Four months later, we would basically have the technology fully developed. They're calling it expansion microscopy. Back then, the expansion step took several hours. Now they've got it down to like five minutes. And it's already being used in labs around the world to map the brain and beyond. One of our hopes is that you could actually hunt down very rare things in a tissue to find the stem cell that generates the tumor, to pinpoint where a virus is as it moves from cell to cell, what causes Alzheimer's really, what causes an epileptic state to develop, what I most feel is a sense of possibility. The possibility of coming right up to the edge of what's known and seeing past it. We're on the conclusion now. Um, so let's give you a summary of kind of some of the things we've been talking about. Um, the brain is the most complex system in the universe. It's split into sections uh, with different models to simplify it. Now, remember that within 10 seconds after loss of blood supply to the brain, you're going to be unconscious. And within five minutes after that, basically, you're going to have permanent brain damage. Now, that's why it's really important, for example, to give somebody CPR um, when uh, they stop breathing so that we can start to try to work their lungs for them and get that oxygen to their brain so that they don't have... Um, brain damage and the, the faster the you know faster we can get the person to breathe again uh, you know on their own the better so the brain is about two percent of your body weight uh, which doesn't seem like a lot but it uses more than 20 percent of your body's energy so it's clearly a, a very important part of your body and remember that number jumps up to like 50 percent uh, when you're a child also remember that neurons are the key building blocks of your nervous system and they're firing all the time. You have 100 billion power-hungry neurons to maintain as we speak. Remember, a lot of the energy that goes into your brain is just responsible for maintaining the neurons, not even firing them, just keeping them ready to be fired with that resting potential. We also have 100 trillion connections, so it's just an amazing amount of connections in your brain. And now we also know that this, uh, these nerve cells fire through the concept of electricity. So without electricity, your heart would not beat and you wouldn't even be able to think. Uh, so that's an interesting idea. Now also, one of the most phenomenal parts of the brain is that it can rewire itself uh, with new neural connections. And that's, that's the idea of neuroplasticity. So there's just you know one little thing I want to share with you quick on neuroplasticity. There was a movie that came out. Uh, you might have seen it. Um, it was a while ago. <laughs> it's a pretty old movie with Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise called Rain Man. And uh, it's actually after a real person named uh, Kim Peek. And this is a guy that was born, um, you know, with some definitely some unique issues, um, you know, abnormalities of his brain. He didn't have a corpus callosum, which is that part of the brain that connects the two hemispheres. And But he developed an exceptional memory. But when they would ask him how does he remember it or how did he come to the, his conclusions, he wasn't necessarily able to explain it. But he would remember exactly what happened on certain days 50 years ago. He would You'd be able to tell him your birthday and he would be able to tell you the day of the week and what happened on that day that you were born um, almost instantly. So it was just a phenomenal memory. Um, so that was a really an interesting uh, way in which the brain rewired itself and in, in a way that's not normal. And it led to some exceptional abilities, but it also obviously led to difficulties as well. So he had a lot of social difficulties, for example. Now, another uh, interesting thing with neuroplasticity is some of this research being done by um, David Eagleman. Um, and uh, he developed this sensory vest. You can watch the TED Talk, but 
the idea is that, um, you know, the sound is going to be interpreted by this vest. And then I believe it's going to vibrate in different areas, uh, let's say on your back, and you're going to feel that. And so when somebody says hello, if you're deaf, you're, you can't hear the sound waves, remember, but you can feel. And so if you have a vest that can tr- that can start to interpret hello and vibrate in a certain way, you can actually teach people how to hear again even though they're deaf. So the parts of their brain that are responsible for hearing, even though their ears are not working correctly, can be can be hijacked and used through the process of hearing through this sensory device that could be strapped to you. So they're actually training people who are deaf to hear again through a different way. And so that's just another uh, an amazing example of how phenomenal the brain is in terms of rewiring itself. Okay, so real quick, we'll go over a couple questions and then we'll let you go. So discussion questions, what information was meaningful or surprising to you during this presentation? I know it was a lot. Remember, the goal was to increase your understanding and application of neuroscience with a broad overview. So I went over a lot of different stuff quickly. The purpose really was not to teach you, um, you know, a lot about a particular subject. It was just to kind of show you a lot of the things that are involved in neuroscience. So, you know, think about that. And then also think about how can you apply this information in your life and your work at Epix. So Isabella, you, Isabella, you can go ahead. What's your question or what's your comment? Um, I really like the point about the circadian rhythm and how um, people with like different shifts of work, like for example, night shift have to like, uh, you know, change their circadian rhythm to fit their schedule, which is pretty cool. Yeah. um, Humans are very habitual creatures. Uh, You'll notice that when you put your shoes on, you tend to put this, you know, a particular side on first. Um, You know, there's a lot of different things in your life that your brain automates to save energy because your brain is a very efficient machine. And so your brain will adapt, but it will also lend itself to routines. And so it's very important that you have, you know, uh, routines in your life, um, whatever that may be. Uh, certain successful people will wake up at like four o'clock in the morning and, you know, they'll do that every day. And they'll say that the early bird gets the worm and they want to get a head start. Um, you know, that's not, it doesn't work for everybody, but, but their, their body will adjust to that. Um, Okay, that's a great point. The circadian rhythm, I, I like that. I'm glad you picked up on that point. Any, anybody else? What else was meaningful or surprising to you? Um, and also, uh, I'd like to hear about how you think you could apply some of this stuff at, at your work at Epics and in your life. Okay, uh, Sarah? I thought the Nova project slash video was really cool. I'd never heard of it before. And I'm like, I don't completely understand it, but I want to do some more reading on it. Um, I want to do like bioelectrical engineering so it's okay. very relevant to my career wonderful yeah um i think that the you know the purpose of me kind of showing you um the video was just to kind of say hey there's some research that's basically currently being done there's a lot we don't understand um it's the most one of the most complicated things if not the most complicated system in the universe and it's very important that we that we understand it, even for AI with the deep learning and um, stuff like that. I mean, it basically mimics uh, the brain and how you learn. And we'll we'll discuss how people learn in the next one. So this is part of a series on education, and this is basically a neuroscience primer for you to start to learn uh, about how people um, form memories and, and and learn. But yeah, absolutely, I think it's wonderful that. Uh, there's new technology that allows us to see it, our brain at a, at a deeper level um, beyond the scans that we have. All right, what else? Uh, Jason? Uh, yeah, for the, the application, I think it's important to remember um, that there's a wide variety of people out there that have a wide variety of abilities as well as um, uh, different things that they, you know, have, they have their individual um, unique Abilities that they're able to, to go through, um, and that each of our projects have important steps that we need to take in order to to um, take that into account. Um, so, like for the park, for the creative park, we've obviously been working on uh, the ADA compliance because of that. But there's some other aspects with uh, color blindness or everything like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just. 
I, I think that it's important to understand that basically everybody has a brain and the capability of gaining new experiences. And those experiences that we have, um, but also nature and nurture, right, uh, are going to basically form who we are. And there's always a reason for behavior and a reason for beliefs. And so it all traces back to nature and nurture. And understanding the brain can help us understand our fellow human beings. It's also a a fairly big unifier in a way, I would think. Um, If you view humans as the human race, basically everybody has a brain and the capability of of making decisions. Um, It's very hard to, you know, be prejudiced or, you know, show discrimination um, because it really unifies us on a biological level. And uh, it's it's a really interesting thing to think about for sure. Um, The human aspect of engineering, right? Because remember that we are partnering with with human beings you know we all experience this uh this biology we all share this and understanding that is is key um anything else with the application or meaningful and surprising okay claire uh, going along with what jason said i thought the concept of how the brain rewires was like super interesting in the sense that it gives people different abilities and it may impact their way to learn and considering like how the user will interact with whatever you create as a product is important and that and some some factor that is how they'll learn how to use it because they likely won't know how in the first place and so to make, to make sure you're making those considerations to how the user will interact with or respond to or learn from or with the product is something that i thought was really important for working in like in where i'm working is like in game design to consider how they'll respond to it and how they'll pick up information from the game yeah Exactly. And, and your game is providing sensory information to them. And you have to consider, you know, are there going to be deaf people that are playing your game? Are there going to be, you know, people who are blind, maybe that could potentially still play your game? There's a lot of research and uh, being done into haptic feedback, where, um, you know, as you play a video game, and you try to immerse yourself in that game, how can you get extra sensory data from a game so that you feel like you're actually there? Well, they make chairs and they make all sorts of things that will vibrate and make you feel like you're there. So, um, you know, if there's an explosion behind you in a video game, it'll make the back of your chair vibrate and you'll just feel like you're immersed in this video game. We also have virtual reality too, which is another interesting thing to think about and how it manipulates our senses into thinking, you know, different things about our environment not only virtual reality, but augmented reality as well. So those are right on the cutting edge of what we're doing in today's society. And it all has to do with getting sensory information to the brain. Well, thank you for for coming. I hope that you took something from this. Uh, I know that it took me a while to kind of compile uh, a lot of the important things that um, I thought I should cover with neuroscience. And so coming soon, we will talk about the science of learning. If you want to join me again on 925, informal learning on 1016, and then human development on 1130. And so that is the series on education. And uh, enjoy the rest of your night.